right, welcome back. We've got a number of political matters to catch up on. Let's bring in Nolan fin Finley, editorial page editor of the Detroit News, and Stephen Henderson of Detroit Today on WDET. Guys, good to have you back again. Good to have Flashpoint back again, as, uh, given a, a couple of, of weeks off. But let's start, uh, though, before we get to politics, with uh, let me let you both weigh in on your thoughts on, on moving forward in the pandemic. And in particular, Stephen, I think you believe that we're going to have to have a lot more private businesses demanding that people be vaccinated, right? Yeah, I think that we have reached the, the sort of pinnacle of the effectiveness of uh, government telling people that they need to get uh, vaccinated. I'm not sure uh, that there's much more that they can do uh, to be persuasive. Um, but imagine if uh, the airlines said uh, you can't get on a plane anymore without being vaccinated. Imagine if restaurants said you can't come in here and eat uh, if you are not vaccinated. How many people who are sitting on the fence or just kind of resistant um, would, would then go and get it because, the, because there's something they want to do? I, I think we, we need more uh, aggressive behavior in that sphere uh, to, to get people to understand that uh, we cannot get back to the world as we knew it before, at least safely, uh, unless a whole lot more people decide to do this. Uh, Nolan, it's really interesting because if enough of the private world then creates that sort of demand for vaccine proof, then even though a lot of people are not comfortable with the idea of creating a vaccine mandate, we've essentially created yeah. one then, haven't we? Well, we have, but we've done it the right way. I mean, we had an editorial Friday. A year ago, we were on our knees uh, praying for some relief from this pandemic. and. You know, the answer came, we got the vaccine. And if you get the vaccine, there's a very, very small chance you're going to either get the va vaccine or suffer the ill effects of it. And so that we have so many people out there who say, nah, okay, we don't want to take it, I think is very frustrating. And, you know, government businesses take steps, society takes steps to protect the people. I'm thinking of seat belts, sprinkler systems in buildings uh, like yeah. like yours there. Yeah. Uh, there are appropriate steps you can take that aren't an intrusion on to liberty. Uh, and, you know, I think it's absolutely uh, terrible for people who aren't vaccinated to ask, to ask those of us who are, well, you all keep restricting yourselves, wearing masks, staying outside, because we don't want to protect ourselves. And so hmm. I'm I, you know, I'm a libertarian, yep. but I think these are appropriate steps, particularly on college campuses, because the least vaccinated group are those 18 to 24 year olds. Right. And if they can't get on campus, if they can't go to concerts, if they can't go in their bars and lounges, they're going to roll their sleeves up. And we're seeing requirements coming out from more and more schools right now. Let's uh, let's move to what we learned over this past week with the uh, primary. Stephen, I, I suppose some would argue in that big field of people who was trying to run, uh, who, who was running for uh, mayor of Detroit, uh, Mike Duggan comes out with 70 percent of the vote. Even if um, if Anthony Adams somehow adds up all of the votes that didn't go for Mike Duggan, he still loses in a landslide. Then um, is it time for us to change the rules and say, well? Well, if you get 70 percent of primary, why should we go on or am I missing the point of a, of a free and open general election in November? <laughs> yeah, I'm still in favor of holding the election. And I think there are good reasons to let people, you know, make that choice between two candidates rather than uh, a nine. But, but I do think that the specific example here is really instructive in terms of a how how popular and powerful Mike Duggan has become. Uh, and and you got to hedge that just a little because this was a very low turnout election, but but yep. all primary elections are. Um, but but also just uh, how uh, that he's not for Detroiters, that he's not working in the neighborhoods where Detroiters uh, have the hardest time. Uh, and time and again, uh, those same Detroiters go to the polls uh, to the extent that they go to the polls and vote overwhelmingly for him. I mean, if you think about these numbers, uh, these are not, these are Coleman Young style uh, wins that he is racking up. And it is the yeah. most uncanny thing that I can imagine uh, in a city that is as heavily African-American as Detroit. He is yeah. effective at selling his message to Detroiters. Yeah, uh, yeah, Nolan, obviously it's a very small turnout in these August primaries, but you get the sense that uh, Stephen's right. There's a, a kind of breathtaking kind of popularity in Mike Duggan, who, of course, famously won a write-in campaign to get this whole thing right. started. Yeah. Right. 
and you know there are places that if you win a majority uh there is no runoff or if you win a super majority right as duggan did there is no runoff i think it's important as you said this was a low turnout the november uh election is liable to be much larger i still think mike duggan is going to win that election going away but it is important for people who uh to have a chance to to have their voice heard to put in a, to put in a protest vote to say hey look there are concerns here that we have that you need to take take care of but his support seems to have come from every part of the city every demographic group yeah. uh it was a major stamp of approval we'll see what happens here as we march toward november then we also had proposal p uh go down uh mm -hmm. by a wide margin uh stephen uh, you and i were talking earlier uh off the air uh, uh, <laughs> you know proposals often pass in detroit elections and this one got its butt kicked yeah i can't remember a time that detroiters have said no to uh, a proposal I haven't gone back and actually checked all of the records, but it's it, it would be one of the rarest things that happens in Detroit politics. And yet, uh, this proposal uh, went down really, really handily. I mean, I think there there were a number of problems uh, with the proposal and its selling. Um, if you think back to the Charter Revision Commission meetings and how chaotic they were for a time, I think that really hurt uh, its chances at the polls. And of course, you had this massive uh, opposition campaign. Um, I, I have been saying all week, though, that, look, there was nothing in that charter revision that we couldn't accomplish through the regular mechanisms of government if the people want that. Uh, you can elect council members who would do all of the things sure, that were in sure. the local P. You can elect a mayor who wanted to do those things. Um, this was an end run in some ways, in the sense that they, they couldn't achieve these things at the council table or in the mayor's office, and they figured, well, let's sew it into the charter. But Detroiters said no. I mean, and, yeah. and, and again, yeah. unusually said no to something that uh, that normally would have passed, I feel like, uh, in the city. Uh, Nolan, I wanted to make sure we get to one other topic. I, I, in this long parade mm -hmm. that we've seen uh, of people being caught up in uh, corruption cases in southeast Michigan over the last couple of years, I don't know, it's easy to say that I was surprised, but I was shocked uh, that Andre Spivey uh, was caught up in this. I'm, I, I, am I alone in that, or were you as surprised as I was? No, I, w I would say two things about that. Well, the first is it's always shocking, given the number of officials who have gone down for corruption, for bribe, bribery, that people are still yeah. <laughs> clueless enough to say, yeah, I'll take that thousand bucks and put it in my pocket. I mean, they see all of the people who are occupying jail cells who once sat in council seats or in other um, positions of power. You're going to get caught. And these folks, for very little money, uh, risk their their future and, and, and risk their freedom. So that always surprises me. Yeah. The other thing, I mean, if you look at Andrew's, Andrew Spivey, you know, six months ago, if you're saying, what's the future of Detroit look like? What's the future of Detroit's leadership? And you looked on that ballot um, Tuesday, had his name on, been on there, you would say, well, there's somebody who could be the future of Detroit, who could sit a little higher up in City Hall someday. And there's not that big a group. And so yeah. it's disappointing in that regard. Sure is. Guys, uh, we're out of time. Thanks so much. Uh, great to have you back on the program again. I hope we'll see you soon. Got to take a quick break. We come back, we'll look back uh, on the legacy of Carl Levin. This is Flashpoint on Local 4.